Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. If you waited long enough, I'd come back, so here I am. Last few Sundays, we've had some extra special kind of couple Sundays, and we had a youth ministry celebration this uh, past Wednesday, so there are a lot of different Sundays uh, just celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done last Sunday. VBSC, our camp celebration was tremendous and very thankful for everyone from Brian to Pam and everyone involved in the camp. Uh, just We just laud and applaud and extol the Lord for all that he did during camp and thank you God for uh, working in people's lives. So very, very thankful for that. And as Dwayne mentioned, our uh, bunch, of, bunch of people that uh, love missions and love the Great Commission. There's a team of people in Honduras, and, and so very thankful for them. Continue to pray for them. And I uh, uh, want to mention long-term missions and tie it together to Alex and Crystal, a little small report, and we'll talk more about them at the Acts 1-8 conference. But you know they, Alex was here just uh, not that long ago preaching the Word of God in our Bible conference in April, and then, of course, we laid hands on them at the end of June, and they were off, and, and they have been um, in Zambia and Lusaka for five weeks, and in five short weeks, they've been able to procure another living space, so they have a, a different uh, place that they're renting, and, and it's even better in a better situation and, and better location and, and, uh, and things like that. They've uh, been able to get to a place where they actually had this morning, which is uh, eight hours difference, seven hours, seven, eight, yes, yeah, around there, I'm there, seven hours difference. In Lusaka, they had their first morning service at a place other than their own home with their uh, uh, three, see, so that's the cool thing. If you have three children, then you have a great congregation, uh, three kids and the wife, and, and they did have one visitor, which is good, sent messages. I saw them very early this morning, some pictures, and, and uh, it was so neat. A beautiful space that they have that they can rent to gather on Sundays and have other things go on. So God allowed them to do that, and they have the finances to do so. And, and so we continue to support them in every form and fashion. Again, I'll talk more about this at the Acts 1-8 conference. You can be supporting them already financially and in prayer, but I'll go into more detail to let you know uh, what God is doing a tremendous thing in, in that long-term, that's long-term missions, meaning that they're church planters, and of course we sent them out. And I want you to know that there's other things. Alex is on the radio in Lusaka, the capital city, on Friday mornings. Uh, Friday, so it would be, it would be like 3 o'clock in the morning, I think, our time, that he is preaching in Lusaka, and uh, he's already had great feedback. He's had four Friday, Fridays where he's been able to preach the Word of God, and some people have gotten saved uh, through that. He has had people call into the show and ask questions. Uh, it's a radio uh, program for one hour where he preaches most of that time, and, and so that's wonderful. He, they are able, through finances, to uh, purchase a portable um, sound system to be able to go out to the marketplace and preach as well. So uh, just want to let you know, just in a few short weeks, Alex and Crystal are in the, Lord, in the Lord and the Word of God and through the mission work that God has anointed them and called him to do, they are making progress already in the city of Lusaka. So that's great to hear. And it ties into where we're at today. Why don't you go to Luke chapter number 14, the end of the chapter, we're going to pick it up in verse number 25, cover 11 verses, and talk about the seriousness of being a disciple, the seriousness of discipleship. I mean, Jesus Christ already from this accounting in Luke's gospel from chapter 1 to this point has been in many, many different parts of the area from Galilee to uh, Samaria and everywhere it must needs go through Samaria and, and of course, Judea many, many places, and he's headed, this is his last trek, he's headed and making his way to Jerusalem uh, for his passion to go to the cross, for to be the savior of the world as we just sung about, and Jesus Christ knows what he's about, he's about his father's business, and it goes from a place of the beginning of this chapter, and this is a great microcosm of, 
of Jesus' earthly ministry. Starts out the chapter with him being in the home of the chief Pharisee with a bunch of other Pharisees and lawyers and interacting over a meal. And uh, he has to deal with their attitude, their uh, sinful heart, their dark heart, their reason for being at the meal. They, they chastise Jesus and call him out of why he's healing on the Sabbath. He returns back Bali, and they do not answer him, of course, and so he levels the playing field there. And then, of course, as we moved on further, we see where Jesus Christ had a great invitation to a great supper after teaching some parable teaching and then teaching and showing through a story of, hey, servant, go out and tell everybody the meal's going to start. That was a couple weeks ago, and the meal's about to begin, and the people that said they were going to come are not going to come. They had the excuses. So here we are at the end of the chapter, chapter number 14, and we're going to pick it up in verse number 25 and see that Jesus Christ now has this great multitude before him. I want you to know that Jesus is letting this great multitudes know that you want to follow me, You want to be partakers of my healing and my feeding and uh, my miracles and my teaching, and but you don't really understand the brevity and seriousness of what it means to be my disciple. So today, just a simple title, It Will Cost You. And as you think of a simple title like that, Everything that we know means something to us in this life costs us something to get really, really serious into. You might get a great start of something and someone might give you something, but when it comes to being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, when it comes to earning your way in the workplace, when it comes to really having a great marriage, it will cost you. Most of all, it'll cost you, you. And so that's where we're headed today because of the text where the Holy Spirit's leading us. 11 verses that show us that it will cost you maybe not as much to follow, but it will cost you to be his disciple. We're going to really look at the meaning of what it means to be a learner of Jesus. This type of thing comes up every once in a while, just as evangelism comes up, just as it all these different pieces in Jesus' ministry. Today, this is what God's given us. Verse 25. And there were great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That's very strong language. We're going to look at the context of it and We'll break into it a little bit and understand what Jesus is saying and how the text is translated to say that word. Others, other translations may some say something different, but here it comes. Hate not his father. You can't have anything be in the way of your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you cannot be my disciple. Verse number 27, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, here's two short little parables, and then the idea of what it means to be salty, to have salt be something very important in our walk. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish it. You can imagine that setting being a tough one personally in that parable teaching. You can relate. You go to do something, you're not able to finish. Hey, what are the neighbors going to think? Didn't finish the house. Verse number 31 through 33, another short parable. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000, or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. Verse 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you 
that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor. It's interesting that that personal pronoun, his, is tied together to salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, sounds like a person. Wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus Christ, in his teaching, in his red letters, is saying, I'm serious about what it means, not just to say, you want to hang out with him, not just, hey, I'd like to align with you, not just, hey, I, I thank you, Jesus, that I can accompany you where you're going. Jesus Christ is saying, it will cost you to be my disciple. In fact, there's three things I want to highlight in what we just read before Again, to a little bit of our introduction. It's part of our introduction. Look at verse 26 again. He cannot be my disciple. That person that does not follow after what Jesus is teaching cannot be my disciple. He says there in verse number 27. It's in there somewhere. Verse number 27 at the end of 27, cannot be my disciple. He then says it again, verse number 33, he cannot be my disciple. One of the places in which each one of us, in whatever place and space we are following Jesus, as we assess ourselves, would say is, can I be more in the Lord Jesus Christ? Can I be better? Can I be healthier? Do I desire that? Or am I just satisfied with how far I've gone? In this case today, as we look at this, please consider that in different types of teaching and discipleship, different, you know, the methods, the step ladders, the growth, the stages, the levels of discipleship. I know Bible verses. I've learned some theology. I, I got to go through a discipleship book and another level of discipleship, go to the Bible Institute. There's so much to take on in the thinking process of whether or not I would like to have more in the Lord. But today I just want to make it really simple yet by the scripture and by the text, have it be very challenging to every one of us, very personally, that it will cost you, and it will cost me. And some of you would say, yes, I, I know, Pastor, it, it does cost to be a disciple of Jesus. It costs your life being lost so his life can be gained. Salvation is the free gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, discipleship is something that's very, very costly. And many, many people looked at what Jesus was teaching and they, they heard it, but they didn't have much, maybe they just didn't have a whole lot of time to go deeper into things. Maybe they were too busy. I just don't know. We'll get into that a little bit more. You see, Jesus Christ is rejected by the unbelieving soul for salvation. As I mentioned, a free gift that's just dismissed. I don't want that salvation. We talked about that two weeks ago when we were in the text that's just above it from verses 15 down through 24 in that invitation to the Great Supper. Jesus Christ is rejected by the believing soul for discipleship, a costly gift missed. Now, let me just be clear again on some other matter. Well, I've been through discipleship. That may be one of the worst phraseology things that we have developed in church culture. I've been through that. I've done that. I've been through discipleship. It's our fault. My fault as a pastor. My fault in the teaching, the rhetoric the improper delivery 
of Jesus' model and method for how to follow him properly as a devoted follower, most of all, as he says, a disciple, someone who's a willing learner, committed and desirous of having all of him and less, and most of all, none of me. In hearing testimonies at the prime summer camp celebration on Wednesday, I heard three different people speak of one simple verse about what John the Baptist said when he approached Jesus Christ in John 3. You must increase, I must decrease. Now here's Jesus at the end of his earthly mystery saying, let me even raise the bar higher. You see, we have so many excuses. In fact, I brought back this slide real simple from last week, and I won't bring it back again. But it fits, because there's always an excuse not to be a disciple. There's always an excuse not to say, Jesus, the free gift of salvation you presented to me, I do and I want to repent of my belief system and believe on you. I just simply want to go my way. Even when the word of God says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I heard a little six-year-old read to me a scripture verse found in Romans 10 with complete understanding and serious to say, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt saved by the work of Jesus, the finished work, the redemptive work. You just sang about it, that name. But we have excuses to reject his salvation, and we have excuses to reject his gauntlet that he's put before us to say, it'll cost you everything. But I understand what it's going to cost you because it cost me everything. But look at what happened when I raised from the dead the third day. Eternity before you. It says up there in our next slide, in terms of our introduction, very simply this. You have excuses and I have excuses. What are the excuses? We come up with not to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. In fact, here's the familiar question. So I'm going to ask you, class participation. It took me, I had to get out my dental tools to pull out teeth with the first service people. Would you please answer my question? (laughs) Please help me. So I hope that you're warmed up. Why are there not more people who are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? Give me some reasons why. You notice I didn't use excuses because excuses are so much different than reasons. (laughs) Go, Liz. Pardon me? Selfishness. Who else? What else? Yes. Comfort. Comfort. Oh! Yes. Rejection. If you follow Jesus and you identify with him and you go out into the community in the world, I don't like you. Could be rejected. Yes. Fear. Fear. Oh, fear. Fear of failure? Fear of rejection? Hmm? Oh, our example. Is that what you said? Because now you're putting it out there. And we also may look at examples that have been in our lives beforehand and go, ah, I don't know. Yes. Don't want to make him. Oh, we don't want to make him king of our lives. How about the cost is too much? Don't have enough time. I've got other things that are more important. I love other things more. That's a tough verse there. To hate. In fact, the toughest part about it, though we might not want to admit it, is to hate my own life. Because the life that I have in this flesh, I'm supposed to allow Jesus Christ to live in me. You see baptism and you see buried in the likeness of Christ's death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. We say this all the time. That comes from Romans chapter number six. You're buried into Christ's life at the moment of salvation and you're raised 
into this new way, this new truth, this new life. So the familiar question is real. The excuse is why? Why won't I sacrifice? Why will I not? One of the worst things that I think you and I could hear is for the Lord Jesus Christ to say, you cannot be my disciple. But in the text, I believe what it's really simply saying is, Mark, you disqualified yourself because you wouldn't come after me. Today, there are multitudes of God followers through the internet, blogs, and YouTube, people thinking about commitment versus the comfort. I think somebody just said that a minute ago. You know me too well. But that's the truth of what Jesus is saying to the great multitudes, is you love the comfort of being around me. You guys, don't you love being in church this morning? Kind of. Okay, good. I'm glad. They really do, Dwayne. They love singing. They love praying. Now the message part, ah! you can endure to the end and you'll be okay in a few minutes. So listen. We love to be around the things of Jesus, but do we love being a disciple of Jesus so much so that whatever the lost and cost is, it doesn't really matter. Jesus Christ has always known our weak appetite for discipleship, not willing to pay the price to be my disciple, my disciple, my disciple, my disciple. Ye cannot be my disciple. Those are awful words. They ring in me. They may not you, and that's okay. I didn't want to hear. I wouldn't want to hear, but there are times where my life and the Lord... Martin Luther said, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. And that ties very simply to what Jesus Christ said to the disciples. He said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It will cost you. It will cost you. The Word of God says, hey, in Jesus' accounting, to follow me as a disciple, not follow me as a passive, I'll catch you on the next rebound Jesus type of fellowship, but to be a disciple, it says up there, it will cost you. Let me give you a quick one minute commercial, but it's not a commercial. Forgive me for even saying that's wrong. For just an overview of things that you have heard, some of you, some of you have not. Discipleship from the Word of God, biblical discipleship, is not an activity, it's an attitude. It's not a program, it's a philosophy. It's not a series of lessons, but a way of life. It's not education only. Hey, I get all this stuff, it's ed edification and exhortation. I, I get built by the Word of God, I get built by someone else in my life. I have something that happens in a group, right over there on Sunday groups, right now in the youth group, over there in Engage, earlier this morning in Investors, over there. In journey, people are being encouraged and edified, so there's a discipleship setting there. But also one-on-one, -on -one, it can be even greater, two-on-two. -two, it can be something in the Bible that is following after Jesus to be a disciple. It's not just teaching only, it's your life as an example being reproduced in another. A handbook, no. A heart-to-heart -heart ministry, yes. A rapid formula, no. That's why I said earlier, I've been through that discipleship stuff. I've been through, I've done it, uh, 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 I've covered that. God forgive us. Because so many people have started their disciple making and disciple living life with Jesus Christ and have stopped, unfortunately. As you know, discipleship involves a number of things. I quoted Luke chapter number 9, verse number 20, 20 to 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Desire, if any man, decision will come after me. Denial, let him deny himself. Dedication, take up his cross daily and follow me. One more. In 2 Peter chapter number 1, verses 4 through 8, some of you love this passage of Scripture because it talks about the progress 
of growth, spiritually speaking, and a disciple who's serious about Jesus Christ and to be that type of person. It says, whereby given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, how? Add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly love, excuse me, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. In that list from old apostle Peter, in his last writings in 2 Peter, he mentions patience godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness charity. I would say that that progress, that growth process that's found in the Word of God about being a person who's a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ reveals beautiful fruit that only can be spiritual, but it will cost you and me. So all I want to do is take these verses and have a simple, simple list of four things that I'll have a supportive verse. I may read them, I may not. I'll have them up there. But I just want to show you four things of what in this text happened when you say, I want to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I understand from the Scripture it will cost me something. It will cost you. Jump on in. What you end up losing and what it costs you will be paid back more than you can ever imagine. If you want to trade anger for peace, if you want to trade discomfort with a stillness in your spirit, if you want to trade off the, unab- the inability to forgive by having a reconciling spirit, if you want to be in a place where the Word of God goes into your life and then works a little bit in there, Holy Spirit of God, and it comes out in your life. And you're not just a nice person because you're just a nice person. When you have really bad roots to start with, like me, you really need a lot of the Bible. You need a lot of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the idea that it will cost me something, my lost life and my carnal life costs me and has cost me more than sometimes I've been able to bear. But the spiritual gain by putting me down, by putting, just putting me away, the gain in Jesus Christ is, it's immeasurable. First one, four. First of four, the cost of being his disciple. This is how I phrased each one of them. An uncommitted following is not discipleship. It's not. Just associating with Jesus Christ comes up short of his demand to forsake all as his disciple. Now, being a follower of Jesus is good. It's good. Let's just put in perspective here. Uncommitted following is not discipleship. It's not being a disciple as Jesus sees it. He's saying, you can't be my disciple and then love all these other things in a competitive way. Simple. One of the most difficult things that get in, gets in relationships in the home, parents, kids, spouses, is a competition, a competitiveness over who's right all the time, who's wrong. The neat thing about having your wife's birthday once a year is that you can take it down a notch. My wife's birthday was Friday, but we're having a birthday weekend. Not a birthday month, Stace, but birthday month could be something adopted. Yes, yes. Of course, it was your sister's birthday as well. But here's the thing. Well, I need to get and do and be better, 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 just to compete. Not, not better in the Lord Jesus Christ because you're going to be less of you and more of him. Well, I'm always right and she's always wrong. 
Guys, come on now, she's always right and you're always wrong. You say that in public, but in private, I know better. We've done marriage stuff together, come on. But you got a good start here, buddy. Admitting it in public is the first step of healing. Very good, very good. My man. So here you go. Think of what Jesus is saying, real simple. If you and I cannot love him more than something else, he says, strong language. The man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, yea, here's the biggie, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple, but you can be a follower. You can be an uncommitted follower, and that's good. But here's where it goes. The identity in the community for you to love Jesus Christ more than anything else, knowing that they know that because you love Jesus Christ, you love your wife, and you love your husband like no other. See, there it is, you see. If you continue to muster your own love, your own disciple-making process based upon your flesh, your carnality, your philosophy, the worldly ways, a couple of quick tips, a little bit of a blog, a little bit of a this, and you don't look at the way Jesus loved, you don't grab a hold of what Jesus does to love, then it will fizzle out. We did a little story, I mean a little series on that. His love never fails, but my love fails. Our love our fellowship. Sometimes fellowship, we think that's enough, and sometimes it's good, but after a while, don't you get tired of just following the crowd at a distance and doing just the same thing to keep up, when in fact you would like to just see what this life in Jesus Christ is like? Matthew chapter number 10, verses 32 through 39, you can write the whole thing down for text later, but let me just read what's up on the screen. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. So, in a similar text, in a different spot in time that he says it, Luke records, Matthew records, but he's saying not worthy. When you hate, if you don't hate someone, basically hate something or someone, you're saying, hey, then you're more worthy than Jesus. What he's using in a reciprocal way with both passages of Scripture teaching the context is, hey, he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It doesn't mean that you lose your salvation. It means that you're not worthy of saying, hey, I'm a disciple, a learner. I'm a willing learner. Some of you have stopped your growth. Some of you, you say, oh, I've been a disciple. I've gone through every discipleship book in the world. For the last 20 years, if Jesus Christ came to you and asked, he'd say, I don't see how you love me more than anything else. We know how we get I've got pretty comfortable with myself over the years, and I don't like that at all. And I've said before, I, I get tired of my, my ways. I would like to have more of the Lord's ways. He that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. You can write down Matthew 16, verses 21 through 28. I read this. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Just another cross reference in Matthew's account of what we have in Scripture in the Gospel of saying, hey, in the synoptic way, Jesus has taught this principle of what it means to be discipled, like he's taught the principle of salvation, taught the principle of, of all things within his teaching in different settings, but he's repeated much of that teaching. You see? To be a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ means you really say, I am his disciple. The cost of being his disciple, number two, an unfinished building is not discipleship. Where do you get that from, Pastor? Well, let's look at that parable. An unfinished building. You are a building. You're looked at as a building. We as a church are a building. Not the physical four walls, but the spiritual part of being a building. We're a habitation of God. We are a vessel that's been set apart for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God in us. So the cost of being his disciple, an unfinished building is not discipleship, just assessing 
looking at things that he just some people spend their whole life assessing evaluating making plans and new strategies you know what i mean just assessing with jesus comes up short of his demand to surrender our will as his disciple i find that many people are on this side of finding that out and you have to get on this side the impediment is, I'm assessing, I'm figuring out, I'm counting the cost, whatever it may be. He didn't put this parable in so that you could count the cost and count yourself out of seeing what it takes to put yourself in by faith to follow Jesus Christ. I've read some better, better more intelligent men than me say that they think that this parable, Jesus is making it personal. He's making it personal. How can he be making it personal? Guess what? It says there, for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth now down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it. Did he count the cost in the Garden of Gethsemane? Was he counting the cost on his way to Jerusalem? Absolutely. It says there, lest happily after he had laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all they behold it began to mock him, but does it say to quit? He said, this man began to build and was unable to finish it. That would be the sad part of the parable. What if Jesus Christ did not go to the cross? What if he counted the cost, got to the place, he said, well, I don't have enough to build it. I'm not going. Jesus Christ saw what it was going to cost. And he saw that that cost was worth surrendering his will to his father to obey him and on that cross and in that grave, up from the grave he arose on the third day. John number 12 says this up on the screen. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. Us, we, it's about that. That's what it is. You look at this and you say, how in the world am I going to have more materials in order for me to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Stop looking at yourself for them. You're not going to find them. Your resources of you have to die and the resources of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God and other people in the Lord and the fellowship of the saints and all that they have and all that God has supplied for you will allow you to build the building and never stop until you take your last breath here. Then the building of the Lord will bring forth much fruit, as it says in verse number 24, because you and I have to die away and he needs to live thoroughly through, him, through us. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it into life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also be my servant. Excuse me, also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Whew. Wow. Serve Jesus, father honors. It's a powerful thought. Again, the cost of being his disciple is not you and me saying, hey, can't finish the building. That's not discipleship. It's okay to start building and quitting and starting and building, but that's all you'll have. If that's the way you want to live your life in the Lord, he's saying, okay, I'm giving you that choice. You have great curiosity of what it'll be, but you've never moved on your curiosity, Mark. Well, we need to move on our curiosity and say, I'm putting the curiosity away. I'm going to jump in and say, I'm done with what I would want for me, and I'm willing to find out what your will is in my life. The cost of being his disciple, number three, an unprepared battle is not discipleship. You do not want to go after this battle, but many of us do, unprepared just aligning with jesus which means hey i like the stuff you teach i like going to church where you go to church i i like your theology your doctrine aligning yourself with jesus though it comes up short if that's all it is of his demand to war in the spirit as his disciple let me immediately go to the text i have in Matthew chapter number 10 again. Go back to Matthew 10. I'm going to actually go right to that text and look at it a little bit more with you. Matthew chapter number 10 again. This is Jesus Christ in Matthew's account of the disciples being called out, the 12, okay? In real time right there, 
2,000 years ago, he called the disciples, chapter 10, verse 1. He gave them power. You have power over unclean spirits, cast them out, heal all manner of sicknesses. So he's giving them this power. He names them all. These 12 Jesus sent forth. You're going to go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? And what comes out of this here? You look up on the screen there. And you go down a ways. Verse number 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as servants and harmless as doves. This is a battle, isn't it? What is it about a king who goes up against another king and sits down down first and calls it? Do you know that with whatever you got, 10,000, you're going to go up with, you're going to go up against 20,000? Well, what about a spiritual war? Well, I know a little bit about the Bible, but I'm going to go down in the inner city and I'm going to talk to some people about Jesus Christ so all by myself. How about if you go with a couple of people that can be praying for you and with you while you're talking to people? How about if you count the cost and I count the cost and look at it and say, wait a minute, I'm just going to align myself with the things of Jesus Christ, but it comes short, comes up short when it comes to the warfare. I need to war in the spirit. Just as the disciples went forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, they're going to be going to some people that had probably are not going to be happy with them. It's a spiritual battle. Verse 18, right up on the screen, he shall be brought before governors, kings, for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And on and on he goes about instructing and telling the disciples what they're up against. Well, just vault forward. You have the word of God and you have the Holy Spirit of God. They don't even have that. But what they do at that time, they got the power of Jesus Christ upon them. That's kind of a good deal. How is it that you and I would look at being a disciple of Jesus Christ and yet come up short with his demand to war this war by the Spirit. Because he says, verse 32 in Luke 14 back there, or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. He puts it in there to say, look, you've got to press through this. Go up against the 20,000 with your 10,000 and say, I see the cost, it's going to be great, it will cost me, but why is it that that's going to stop me from being his disciple? Because I am afraid, because I am fearful, because let's just be straight up, you love you more than you love him. We love ourselves more than we love Jesus Christ a lot of times. What are you going to risk? My wife and I have never spoken of those three years before my daughter was murdered. We've never spoken of the life that she went through. But I'll tell you, without warring that in the spirit, because it's a spiritual battle as much as it's a physical battle. And I will say to you, that your own life has the same elements and pieces of warfare and even greater. Some of you battle things that I don't know, but I know that the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a spiritual warfare, the Holy Spirit of God, the Word of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness will protect your heart, the loins will gird about with truth, your midsection will be guarded by the truth of his word. And on and on we go, it's a spiritual thing. And if you don't spend an hour or two in scriptures on a daily basis, you'll find out when you wake up 10 years from now that you are a good follower, but disciple-wise, you missed out. But let's reboot and let's reset and let's be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and let's get in there a little bit more and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can do more in me if I would just allow you permission, Jesus, to do more in me. But it will cost me. But the life we're living already is costing us anyway. I'd rather not lose any more ground than I've lost with the Lord Jesus Christ. Last one, number four. The cost of being his disciple 
and unsavory salt is not discipleship. When something like salt has lost its savor, it can't do the work of purifying. It can't do the work that it's meant to do just amalgamating. The word amalgamate means to unite or merge. You say, well, uniting with Jesus. Well, yeah, join his club. That's where I'm after him. Yeah, just amalgamating with Jesus Christ comes up short of his demand to affect others as his disciple. Our example. That's where I was going. Right that. Because see, if I, you, we, as salt, because it says his, so it's a personal pronoun, masculine, his. So salt, so salt is regarded as, of course, masculine in its word, but I, I look at that thinking, what is he saying? An unsavory salt is not discipleship. Unsalty people discipling other people will not become very salty. What does that mean? Send me an email, I'll explain it to you. As I said to your son months ago, every day is the Super Bowl. He thought I meant football. Every day is the Super Bowl. Every day you're at the highest place as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ as savory salt affecting other people in your life. And when you lose your savor, you won't taste very good. It says that that salt, when it's lost its savor, is not even fit for the dunghill, the trash heap. It was used to calm the odor down, the nastiness of that salt heap. It is said that when salt loses its savor, it's just cast aside of the road. Maybe they'll use it as a base for how they make another road. I use this last scripture here to pull the message together. It's one of the all-time faves that really puts it to us. Luke chapter number 9. It's a toughie. Oh, Luke 9, Luke 14. Obviously, you can tell I think that they're pretty good spots to push us. This has been a push for me. It's been a push for you. Let's just be pushed as we finish. Verse 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Great declaration. I will amalgamate. Understand the English language, Mark. I will come along. I will allegiance with you. I will attend with you. I want to be around you. Jesus says, hey, if you're going to follow me, then you're not going to have a house. Foxes have holes, the birds are air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. If you're going to come with me, you ain't going to have a place to live. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me, allow me to first go and bury my father. Jesus says to him, ha, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61 and 2, here it is. It's just tough stuff. Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at home at my house. And Jesus said to him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean you're kicked out. It just means that Just hanging out with Jesus is fine. But salt, don't lose your savor because then your effect on other people will not be Jesus. It will be you. And you know how good we do with us. Jesus says, you put your hands to the plow, don't look back. Stay on it. Stay with it. Don't back off. Keep plowing the field. Find out what it means to be a willing learner, disciple of Jesus Christ. Discipleship means giving one's loyalty. Who are you faithful and loyal to each and every day of your Christian life? Why are you and I so demanding of Christ, yet do not meet? 
his demand for you. Why don't you stand for a word of prayer? Debbie, please go ahead and start our invitation music. I'm just going to make a short prayer and leave the altar for you, your seat for you, so that you can do business with the Lord. The question remains, what are you and I faithful and loyal to each and every day? Why are we so demanding of Jesus, but yet we don't meet his demand of us? Father in heaven, have your way in this time of prayer and invitation. You've confronted us with great truth, and I thank you by your grace and your mercy, your love and your goodness. Deal with each one of us as we deal with the things you've put on our hearts. In Jesus' name, I pray. Please come.